public and university affairs um, at the U of T Student Union. And we're so grateful that you're willing to take the time to talk with us and have this interview with us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a nice, as I would say, it's a nice blast from the past getting back, uh, not, not really involved in, but adjacent to U of T student politics because I was uh, involved in CASA at U of T for almost 10 years, the Cognitive Science Group, and it was a two-term student president there. So it's been quite the... Uh, pipeline going through there via the pirate party which is why i'm against intellectual property well related to why i'm against intellectual property and working for the ndp last year and uh, doing this this year with the municipal socialist alliance so yeah thanks for having me yeah thank you thank you so much for coming um and i guess we could start off we're wondering if you could introduce yourself to us sure. and tell us a little bit about your campaign right well my name is adam golding i lived in ward 11 for 20 years i was born here at mount sinai hospital i also went to school at ut uh, I grew up in Barrie, but uh, ever since then I've been down here and uh, but spent the first year of my life down here. Um, I've, as I mentioned, been involved in different kinds of political efforts, worked for the NDP last year, and um, a lot of things have been going wrong recently. And, uh, you know, I've spent years focusing more on music after doing teaching computer programming and stuff like that. But a lot of things happened that seemed to give me no option but to get back involved in politics. I was kind of putting it off. Um, after student politics, I was kind of like, you know what, I'm going to focus on some other stuff and, you know, you always know, do politics when you're old. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, a lot of things happened. Um, Hillary Clinton was given a 98% chance of victory, which was a, a red flag for disinformation. And um, that, that meant I had to quadruple my time studying politics and, uh, and uh, also quadruple the political spectrum that I consumed to understand where that disinformation was coming from. And, and a lot of things happened locally. Under John Tory, we had uh, a lot of, uh, well, I would call it three waves of authoritarianism. We had the dispensary raids in which uh, a coworker of mine uh, lost custody of her child, uh, you know, and they put blocks in front of the cafe dispensaries and everything like that. Uh, we had what some feel to be overreach when it comes to COVID measures, and certainly uh, there's always been the risk of it being the introduction of more authoritarianism, like the shock doctrine. And uh, we've had the overreach of the violent and cam and evictions and, and even just suing Khalil Savright for building tiny structures. That made me realize that something was really wrong in City Hall. And, um, you know, um, I was one of the many protesters arrested at Lamport 2 um, and almost at Trinity Bellwoods. And a lot of people were injured, harmed, ticketed, charged and so on. Some people are still facing charges. Mine have been dropped. Um, but uh, the city will be recovering from the trauma of those events for a long time. And John Tory is at the top of it. Um, John Tory. Uh, was basically giving orders, although maybe not officially, directly, completely, but to uh, the city manager's office, which was Chris Murray uh, heading that. He's stepping down. His second command is is filling in Tracy Cook, and Tracy Cook was giving commands to John Burnside. There is a petition to fire Tracy Cook that you should sign, and John Burnside is running for election. You should vote against him. And uh, basically, Team Tory works as a block. They, they have a voting block. You can look at the any candidates, team any incumbents, Team Tory percentage on the City Hall Watcher blog, which I recommend from Matt Elliott. He also writes very good articles in the Star, including one about the total cost of the encampment evictions. I mean, the financial cost, never mind the personal, physical, and psychological cost. But um, and um, that Team Tory percentage tells you how much people just vote exactly like John Tory. Uh, he he whips the vote. He doesn't really need strong mayor legislation. That's for in case. Uh, he loses or in case um, too many of his, of his voting block lose. And there's two groups that are basically putting together picks against Team Tory, the Socialist Alliance and Progress Toronto, the Socialists and the Progressives. I'm one of the co-founders of the Socialist Alliance, and uh, we're waiting to see who Progress Toronto picks. But basically, um, that's the that's the lay of the land to get Team Tory out of there. It's it's not just about getting rid of him. Uh, hashtag evict John Tory is important, but we're really evicting Team Tory. And uh, everyone keep your eyes peeled for uh, any additional picks coming from those groups. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, and then we could dive into a little bit more about kind of the key issues that students are really concerned about. Um, we'd yeah. love to hear your insights. Um, so in terms of housing, so the average monthly cost of one bedroom apartment was 1,421 in the fall of 2020, um, which is a 13% increase from two years before. So how are you planning to support low-income youth and ensure that buildings also meet the rent to safety standards? Right. Well, I, ironically enough, safety standards are important, but they have to be made relative because sometimes they can be at, in flying the face of affordability. I'll give you a very kind of concerning example. I, I have been going regularly to a meeting held by Chris Glover, MPP in Fort York, spent in Fort York about homelessness. And um, 
a presentation was given there from someone who explained a whole project that was worked out to um, put tiny homes in parking lots. And this is not that different from Khalil putting them in parks, but you know, they, uh, they had worked them out to whatever they thought was safe and found it was costed that they could do it. And part of the reason for doing this is to decentralize services and shelter shelter beds so that you don't have a spike in crime when you get past a certain threshold, a certain density, because that's actually what creates that the spike in crime is a certain density. So they wanted to spread it out. They had a plan all costed out. They're like, hey, we can do it. This is cheap enough, blah, blah, blah. But the building code actually made it impossible because they said, well, this is a lot safer than sleeping outside. Um, and it's also safer to our communities because it reduces crime. Um, but it doesn't meet the building code, which means they get fined, they have to pay something or they can't do it or get charged, whatever the, the details are. Um, there's red tape. And that, um, this is not tape, <laughs> that, that red tape, um, prop, in some cases could mean that somebody dies. The, the detail in, in the case of Khalil Saver building the tiny structures in the parks, um, they, they were worried about insurance costs for those structures uh, burning down. And John Tory used to, he probably still does, go, go up and say things like, well, these structures are not safe. And you know, so he says that in absolute terms. He doesn't say safe compared to what? They are safe compared to his condo, and they are, un they are, they are sorry, they are unsafe compared to his condo. They are safe compared to sleeping outside. Uh, the thing is, he's not talking about safety to the people sleeping in them. Um, they, they, you know, encampments often ask for fire extinguishers, wouldn't get them from the fire department. Why? Because it doesn't eliminate the liability. They're afraid of their insurance premiums going up. It's an unpriced externality, and um, it's cheaper for the city for someone to die in the cold than for them to survive a tiny shelter fire. And so these these safety standards need to be uh, uh, relative rather than absolute. The the building code needs to say, okay, a building should be this safe. But if you have no building at all, that's even less safe. And the null structure needs to be regulated by safety standards as well. We need to expand safety standards to include saying that this, the building with no walls and no roof and no floor, well, that violates all the building codes. And you, you need to basically uh, have it relativized in that way because we're actually making, we can make things less safe by trying to make them more safe. I have this weird standard, which means, okay, you get no housing at all then because it's not safe enough, which is ridiculous. Most people would rather have an unsafe house than no house at all. Um, you know, we're not talking about, obviously there's reasonable things, but that was not what we were dealing with Khalil's structures. They weren't collapsing, um, you know, at any rate. Um, and as far as the actual affordability, well, there's a lot of things we need to do there. We need a municipal shelter subsidy that is indexed to actual housing prices. In Quebec, they have benefits that are indexed to inflation. We don't do that here. We have an argument every few years. And we need real rent control. This is what Jessica Bell put in her Rent Stabilization Act. And um, looks like the NDP is going to go for another push on that one uh, at the provincial level. And, and we're here to support them municipally and the Socialist Alliance on that bill. Absolutely. Uh, you know, like culturally, uh, in terms of the conversation, because um, we need rent control, which stays implies in between tenants so here where i live although my landlord is great um they in principle have a perverse incentive to evict me because if they do the new tenant pays would pay a much higher rent um and that there's be no reason for that it, it, you know rent evictions are their own problem as well we got to regulate those more but with we, we would stop the bleeding if we had real rent control um and we also need a daily meeting to see how many evictions there are how many exposure deaths there were each day we need a daily crisis meeting about this and the opioid crisis, which is connected to the housing crisis. But when I was in student government, I started to see the rent prices going up and people who are, you know, uh, supposedly affluent enough to go to U of T, they, uh, they having trouble with housing and it, you know, the, the prices just skyrocketed after then. But uh, the if we had had real rent control 20 years ago, we wouldn't be in this pickle now. Yeah, that's definitely. the most important thing. 100% like rent stabilization would help so many people. Um, and kind of relating to that, when you mentioned the shelter, we do notice that a lot of students end up homeless um, or in like affordable housing projects. They're generally caught in this cycle of poverty that's really hard to escape. So what policies do you envision that the municipal government could implement to change that and give people a way out? The cycle, the cycle of students in particular ending up in poverty? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the policies are, are citywide. Um, you know, uh, um, student benefits do currently come from the, the city. I, I certainly wouldn't object to have anything targeting uh, education in specific, but, it, but I think we really need universal benefits, actually. Because, look, I don't, I don't think you need to be enrolled at U of T to be educating yourself. I went to U of T for 10 years, and then I kept, you know, I was teaching myself before and after U of T, and I was teaching people at U of T for free, writing free events. You know, our education is something we have to always take into our own hands, and the idea that, um, oh, well, this, these, this benefit is only tied if you're actually enrolled at a fancy schmancy institution 
Um, I think that's that's bullshit. You know, like not that what's taught at U of T is bullshit, but I think the idea that you have to institutionalize your learning, you just have to give people money. You need universal benefits, not specific to students. Everyone is a student. Everyone should be learning. If you're not a student, you're doing something wrong. You should be learning every day. Our collective learning rate is the main thing to optimize, actually. Like, you know, the cops aren't learning from civilians. Governments aren't learning from, from civilians, from citizens. You know, it's, um, and, and so for that reason, I think it, it, this is similar to talking about uh, UBI versus like OW, right? Because OW is tied to specific requirements. You have to be this poor, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and they spend money figuring out whether they should give you the money. And I think, it, and also, and it creates resentment because people say, well, they're getting something that I don't get. Whereas if we say, no, no, basic needs are actually universal. And that includes education, and that includes housing, and that includes food. Then we can say, okay, well, what is the price of housing in Toronto? What is the price of food in Toronto? And what's the price of education in Toronto? U of T is driving the price up. But if we if we uh, did a sample of what are people, you know, some people, I mean, I teach private lessons, much cheaper than people going to U of T music. I could save people, I can save some people a lot of money for what they want, what they want to learn, you know, um, if they don't need the, the credentials. Um, and it's you know theoretical side of things. Um, we need to subsidize private education uh, if possible. Um, I just submitted an arts program that you'll see um, coming through Arts Vote. I think they're going to publish it. Um, they're publishing what people sent in, or I'll put it out. And um, one thing that a lot of people said when I asked them was about subsidizing live music fees, also subsidizing things like music education. Um, so like the cost of education is too high, and that's one reason that students end up homeless. So education needs to be cheaper because it's a basic need. And the same is with housing and food. But I, I don't believe actually really in there being a special category like okay here's the years where we're really going to educate them now and then we just sort of give up on someone's education. Um, everyone always needs the free time to learn, and everyone always needs the free time to be creative. Um, for that reason, you might even reduce the work week, but you have to make education cheaper and the basic needs there for everyone. So these universal benefits, um, then we can have a conversation about what does anyone need for food, what does anyone need for learning, and what does anyone need for housing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and kind of relating to that on the affordability side, when we talk about transit, it's yeah. increasingly difficult for students to pay in the face of you know, rising inflation and the existing barriers for low incomes. So what solutions do you envision that individuals with low income and students will be able to more sustainably afford public transit? Transit should become free at point of use as fast as politically possible. Um, I'm not sure if that takes one year or four years or how long that takes. Really, it depends on what turns out to be the relationship between the provincial and municipal governments. But um, transit free at the point of use is better for climate and it's better for inequality, as you were mentioning, you know, poor students need to get around and it's better for privacy. Uh, I started a hashtag years ago called hashtag boycott Presto. Um, please don't use Presto. Systems like Presto are used to track illegal immigrants. This is also been, already been confirmed in Vancouver. Um, police use Presto data without a warrant. Um, a Presto employee already uh, looked up a woman's data to ask her out on a date, which was unwelcome. Uh, you can read that story in one of the papers. I forget where it was. And you know, it's and, they, and even if you have an anonymous card, they could track you just by your trip patterns. And they they want to put targeted ads on the subway as well, which is also a privacy issue. And so, if you don't actually charge, this is very similar to the universal benefits. If you're not charging people and worrying about who gets to ride and who doesn't, then you don't have to spend money on fare inspectors. You don't have to spend money on the Presto boxes you should pay for transit basically on people's income tax or any kind of similar method. And it's uh, much better than a carbon tax. Carbon tax disproportionately affects the poor. Um, you know, I, I heard a phrase the other day in the majority report that you shouldn't tax them all, you should tax the rich. Uh, well, you know, giving, giving free transit to people, that disproportionately helps, helps the poor. And it will reduce carbon emissions, increase privacy, and also reduce congestion on the road. So it's a win-win for everyone in the long run. You just have to get the ball rolling. Some of these things you need the feds to kick it in to get it started if it saves money in the long run, because uh, they control the printer. Um, definitely working towards free transit is definitely an important goal like for the city. And, yeah, for and that's, a, that's a socialist alliance position everywhere so all, as well. All of the alliance candidates are running on a free transit platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and um, another question we have is related to mental health. So according to the regional National College Health Assessment Survey in 2019, 52% of students reported feeling depressed and 60% have anxiety. So during the pandemics, the heightened global uncertainty, we have certainly seen an increase in the number of students that have mental health illness compared to previous years. And post-secondary institutions are struggling with their efforts to adequately support students. So what changes do you think the municipal government can or should make to help students' mental health? 
That's interesting. I mean, it's hard to say sometimes which changes would be at the um, university level and what would be municipal and so on. Um, you're absolutely right about the mental health issues, especially affecting students and especially at U of T. It's a very, very, very stressful place. And I saw a lot of people's mental health really severely affected during their time there. I saw people run themselves down with sleep deprivation. And then they'd have the symptoms of sleep deprivation, which match the symptoms of ADHD, and they would be prescribed stimulants, which would make their sleep deprivation worse. Same thing happened to me, actually. And, but uh, there was, when I was in student government, over half of the exec was on speed. And these drugs produce compliance as well. And uh, you know, uh, we need our, our smart people to be creative, not just workforces. You know? um, and so that's the most, I, I think this goes back to what I mentioned earlier, regulating the work week. But the, then I thought, well, it's pretty difficult to regulate the work week of a U of T student, right? How could you, <laughs> could you find the university for working with them too hard? Because you know, that's the thing, people want to put in those extra hours to be competitive. So it's, it's very difficult in that environment when you're at basically the top school in the country and everybody wants to win. Um, the, the, what you really need to do is you need to make more teaching positions. So if you, if you improve the student teacher ratio, now this is not just a municipal thing, unfortunately, but this is going back to working backwards from learning rate. Our learning rate would be much higher if we had more teachers, like oh, no brainer, right? So, um, you know, I think we should have the administrators and double the teachers to start and see how that goes. And I think everybody would uh, be a lot more sane because for one thing, there'd be more jobs to go around. So people wouldn't be fighting their close uh, comrades and friends and peers uh, for the scraps, you know, because they expanded education, they expanded the bureaucracy and the enrollment, they didn't expand for professor positions, you know, and, and that's a, that is a compliance thing and it drives everybody crazy because it, you know, um, Noam Chomsky remarked how student debt is a disciplinary tactic. So, you know, we, we basically we need free education, we need more jobs for professors, and uh, we uh, hopefully need a, you know, a better work week for students. When I was a student president, I made events to help people relax, basically social events at the end of the week, because people just needed to get out more, <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to be a workforce and read all those books, but, you know, you, you've got to relax at the end of the week. And um, so that, that's one thing student governments can do. That's not really a municipal government thing. Although, you know, maybe the municipal, maybe the municipal government should come in. This is half serious, but you know, just come in and say, U of T, you need to relax. So the city is going to make you relax by like throwing you a party. <laughs> that, that, you know, the, you know what? I just thought of that now, but I, I can't, I can't say that's a bad idea either, but as long as it's not too expensive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like I feel like with U of T, a lot of this comes from the isolation and alienation. Yeah due to the stress. So community is definitely important in terms of addressing mental health. Yeah. Um, and one final question from us is that um, recently with the media, we see an increase in crime rates in the city of Toronto. So do you intend to put more emphasis during your tenure as counselors on increasing police enforcement in the sense of increasing police funding, for example, or turn towards a more rehabilitative preventative measure like more responses or expand poverty alleviation um, would you have a leaning between those two uh, yeah very very strongly towards defunding the police by 50 percent um, I'm not an, a complete abolitionist there have been police in my family police have saved my mother's life I believe you can't have a hundred percent defund platform and be feminist but all of the socialist alliance candidates are running on a 50 percent defund platform and we will be trying to add more candidates to the alliance but only if they support a 50% defund platform. I mentioned earlier, I was personally arrested and injured by the police at Lamport too, a lot of people were. And uh, the police are, spent probably over $50 million on encampment enforcement, including the city manager's office with former cops. We have to fire Tracy Cook and not uh, reelect John Burnside in part because they are former cops with an authoritarian mindset, which affects their policy. And it's why we didn't take a human rights approach. We took a violent approach towards, excuse me, towards encampments. Um, so we have to defund by 50%. The police should only focus the focus this police should only work on violent crime full stop there should be no police spending on anything which isn't about violent crime and most of the spending should go in towards improving response time you know all of that money that we spent uh, enforcing encampments uh, evicting encampments in parks it didn't do anything to response time if anything it brought it down because it sat resources which could have gone into like the opportunity cost you could have put that money into improving response time for real emergencies but their emergency was they lost their sense of control and they had a film contract in Alexandra Park, which is why they rushed and, you know, uh, they didn't take the human rights motion that we voted on unanimously at City Hall, by the way, like we had a unanimous vote. Everyone said, yeah, sure, human rights. And then we didn't do that. We also had a zero in Kamets motion, which is contradictory to that human rights approach that, you know, um, it, it's, a, it's a holy day moved it. Wong Tam actually voted for it, despite her progressive veneer. 
she voted for the zero encampments motion and her chief of staff, it was on her chief of staff's watch, who's now running against me in Ward 11. Uh, she's parachuting over from Ward 13. By the way, none of my opponents live here that I can tell. They're all parachutes, so, you know. Um, anyway, so yeah, we have a huge problem with authoritarianism. We have to defund the police by 50%. We need radical reforms as well. Um, you know, uh, we need, first we need, uh, before the next thing I'm gonna say, we need community oversight where we can vote down what the police are doing as a people. We need to be able to vote down their spending, even if it's all spent on violent crime, we just say what you're spending like, you know, you know, imagine if the police were spending millions and millions of dollars enforcing a, a very mild violent crime, like, you know, children in school who like, like flick people with their finger, you know, cops going into school. There are cops in school sometimes and we are against that. And um, the, the, the community should be able to vote on priorities. They say, no, actually this kind of crime is the priority. What we, what we want you to focus on is, you know, you know random street violence or worried about gun violence or worried about domestic violence. You're like, what, what is the priority? And we should be having that conversation. And what should not even be on the list is people sleeping in a park. That should not be the police's job because here the police always have guns. So by definition, if you if you use cops for something like that, you're sending a gun to a knife fight, or actually you're sending a gun to a pillow fight or a sleepover. You know, it's 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 um and it predictably created violence. The city manager's office should have known that the city contains people with a moral compass who would have resisted what they're doing, but they're just so far gone that they didn't even see that coming. So uh, we've got a real problem with policing the city and uh, the cops need to be cut in half, especially if we can cut council in half. Thank you so much for the insight. That was really helpful. Um, and I think that's everything from our end right now. And we're wondering, so we recorded this, um, if it's everything will be put in your own word, but if there are some edits in like some part that needs to be reduced in length, if that would be okay. Yeah, sure. Just to run it by me for a quick check for accuracy. Yeah, absolutely. We'll send you before we like publish it. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And one more thing we're wondering is we're hoping to have a photo of yours included um, next to your answers. Yep. Would you send the photo uh, of yours to us? Oh, yeah. I'll send it. I got a new photo this weekend. So uh, I, got a, I got a brand new one. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Then we'll be in touch um, as soon as we have this all edited and then we'll um, ask for your approval. And okay, thank great. Well, well, thanks so much, Victoria. I'm really glad you're doing this. And uh, don't hesitate to get in touch if, uh, if the paper wants to discuss anything else. Um, we, you could even do a piece talking to um, uh, Barry, one of the co-pairs of the Alliance. He's not running, but helping to coordinate all of the folks. And uh, like I was saying, if you ever want to do something about like a deep dive into student politics versus real politics, could be real fun. So uh, feel free to pass on those ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, definitely look into that. Thank you so much for doing the interview with us. Really appreciate it. Okay, have a great day. You too. Have a great day. Bye.